take both of them down.
Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome. Come on in, have a seat. I can't think of a better way to start our service than the way we're about to start it, with some baptisms. Pastor, are you there? I am indeed here. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, the old has gone and the new has come. What I love about baptism is that this water doesn't transform or change anybody. It is a symbolic picture of what has already taken place inside of the heart. As a matter of fact, this, this uh, baptism is actually a picture of a water grave. Anyone that steps into a bat- baptism can declare the good news of the gospel that the old has gone and the new has come, but also that Jesus Christ came. He died on a cross. He was buried, and behold, he rose again. And that is what's so great about having a baptism on Palm Sunday. Amen. That's right. Give God the glory. So we have two baptisms today. Um, First is going to be Richard Norant. Richard has been a believer for quite some time. But um, he recently said, you know what, I have uh, yet to experience and be a part of believer's baptism. Remember, believer's baptism is when someone says and declares, hey, after I came to know Christ, I want to declare uh, the fact that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. So um, I'm going to give you a chance to do that. Richard, who is Jesus to you? Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Amen. Then upon your profession of faith, you just stand right there. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Next is going to be someone that you might all know uh, uh, well is Terry Wagner. He's been a a part of this congregation for for about five or six years. Terry and Linda Wagner, y'all may know them. Uh, Terry also came and said, you know what, I have yet to receive a believer's baptism like we're talking about here. Um, And he asked Jim Dininger, who is a retired pastor, though he would say he's just a tired pastor, right? Jim, come on out. I got you here. He asked Jim if Jim would be willing to baptize him, and I said absolutely. So um, I'm going to take off my mic. So. Well, I I just want to say one thing, and that is, in all the years of been baptizing folks, I've never worn a vestment, <laughs> a baptismal vestment, and I am truly whelmed. Praise <laughs> God. My brother, have you by faith accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I have. And is it your desire to love him and to serve him and to worship him all the days of your life? Yes, it is. Then, my brother, on your profession of faith in Jesus and in obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't get a hug. (laughs) Amen. Let's go home. No, just kidding. (laughs) Let's uh, let's stand together. Let's read God's word. Let's read our scripture memory verse for the week. John fourteen one. Ready? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. John fourteen one. There's power in the name of Jesus. Let's sing this together.
shall reign. He shall reign forever. Sing that one more time. Crown him king. Crown him king of kings. Come on, church. Crown him Lord. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Right? Now, don't be seated yet. Don't be seated. We're going to go ahead and do our prayer time. All right? So I didn't want to seat you down and then get you back up. And now, if you want to take the posture of sitting down for prayer and you need to, you go ahead. But the altar is open for you. You take whatever posture uh, you need. And uh, we're going to pray together. So this is our time of corporate prayer where we come to the Lord together as a church body. So join me as we do that. Father, we come to you recognizing you for who you are. You're the almighty God, the holy one. There is none like you. And Father, our prayer this morning is your will to be done. Father, help us to to live the way we need to live to be holy as you are holy. We can't do it without you. Father, I pray, Lord, if there's, for those here today or those who are maybe not here today who are experiencing illness or or sickness, Father, that you would just, Father, give them comfort and rest and, Father, healing. Father, for those who are hurting in other ways, Father, just let them know that you are the one we can run to. You're our Father. Father, I pray if there's one here this morning who's never received your grace and mercy, who's never surrendered themselves to you, that this would be the day of their salvation. Father, for this country, Lord, we need you. Father, we need you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all that he's done for us. We pray these things in his name. Amen and amen. Now you can be seated. We're going to take an offering. We got a special treat for you this morning. So as you ushers prepare to take the offering, pass the plate. You give as God has given to you. And uh, come on up, sir.
darkness has now ended in the kingdom of light in the kingdom of light forever under your dominion you're the king of my life you're the king of my life sing it church you reign above it all you reign
was the only one who could ever say, you're worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you, oh, we live for you, Lord, and we sing, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you.
Amen. What a great morning. It's been a great morning. So grateful to be here. Will y'all please turn to Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 through 17. Matthew 21, verse 1 through 17. We're talking about when Jesus Christ comes to town, what will he do? When Jesus comes to town, you have to forgive me for that sermon title. It sounds like a Christmas special. Um, my kids reminded of that, uh, that to me this morning. My kids have brutal honesty. <laughs> Heavy on the brutal. Um, but when Jesus Christ comes to town, what will he do? Well, what did he do? So we're going to look at Matthew 21. This is Palm Sunday. This will be the Sunday when Jesus Christ does come into town, into Jerusalem. And he has all the momentum you could ever imagine. Three years of miracles and ministry. At the apex of his ministry was that he just raised Lazarus from the dead. And there's so much excitement and energy. And this is Passover week where the town was swelling with people. And there was a sense of momentum. What will Jesus do? And he will destroy all of the expectations of man. We all have expectations of God. And some of those expecta expectations are good and glorious and holy and righteous and biblical. And some of them are just man-centered just things that we want God to do for us because he's supposed to do that because we want to use him somewhat as a tool. But what God does for us is he does not go directly to what we think he's going to do. He aims for our heart. That may be something you're very used to hearing. But you know that Jesus Christ is aiming for your heart? Not just those that are lost in the room, but those who are saved. I want y'all to think about Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The door of what? The door of your heart. Believer. Written to believers. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and dine with him and he with me. The picture even in Revelation is that the church sometimes pushes Jesus out of fellowship because we are so, our hearts are crowded and clouded with all kinds of things in our life. And we need God to drive those things away. So we're going to be looking at that this morning. So why don't we close our eyes and pray for just a moment and ask God just to bless his word this morning. God, we just come before you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. And thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that we got to see two baptisms today, Lord. And we know, God, that you want to see that baptism, baptismal full, full with people that have prayed to receive Jesus and want to Go forth in public proclamation of the good news. Pray, God, that we see more and more of that. I pray, God, that we see a city, in a sense, soaking wet because they have received you as Lord and Savior. God, would you do whatever you need to do in our hearts this morning? You transform us, God, according to your word, to be the mobilized army, God, that you've called us to be. And, Lord, we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Well, point number one, if you look at verse number one, Jesus Christ will destroy the expectations of man. He will destroy them. He'll do them in several ways. First of all, when Jesus Christ came, he was preparing to die and not to reign. This week, this Passover week that he would be preparing for, that he'd be coming into Jerusalem for, was not so much about him reigning, but about him dying. Look at verse 1. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. That city is closely connected to Bethany. We know that in John chapter 12, 1 through 3, it says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead and they gave a dinner for him and Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table and what did Mary do but took a pound of expensive ointment from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair she poured it out upon his feet to prepare him for burial in fact, when people were rebuking him, he says, no, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. He is hanging out with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, whom he had just raised from the dead. And when he's looking at Lazarus, I believe he is looking at the fact that I am going to die in the same way that you died. I will be put inside of a tomb. Lazarus was resurrected. Jesus will be resurrected. But first, he will take Take upon himself all of the sin in this room. 
all of the sin in this room and from all the generations before and all the generations that will come. He will absorb upon himself on that tree the sin and the weight of the world, literally. Psalm 22, he will cry out. The prophetic psalm of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In just a few days, in just a few days, that will take place. Later in Psalm 22, it says, I am poured out like water. I am poured out like water, just like Mary is pouring out this perfume on his feet. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint, not broken, but out of joint, in a sense, broken. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my chest because Jesus is going to die. My strength is dried up and my tongue sticks to my jaws with thirst. And you lay me in the dust of death. That sounds pretty gruesome. Well, that's what we celebrate as the church. He's taking upon himself the sin of the world so that we can take on all of his righteousness. That is the good news of the gospel. As we celebrate on Friday, come to Good Friday. We're going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper, being reminded of his death, his atoning work, his substitutionary work for us. But not only that, Jesus fulfilled scripture in this moment. He is fulfilling scripture because he wants to rescue us from a sea of new age experience-based nonsense that we call truth. Look what it says in verse 2. Go to the disciples and say to them, go into the village in front of you. And immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to underline it in your Bible to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. The prophet Zechariah in 9 and 9 say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt to the of a beast of burden. We might think that doesn't really matter. In a sea of abyss that literally says there is no truth. Truth cannot be found. There were 456 Old Testament prophecies about Jesus Christ. Do you know how many he fulfilled? 300 of them in his life. What about the rest of them? Those are the ones that he will fulfill when he returns. Folks, he will return and he will fulfill all the rest of the prophecies. If just 48 of the prophecies were fulfilled, they did a mathematical equation, it would be to the chances of 10 to the 157th power. Does anyone know what that means? It means this. Let's put it in layman's terms. You winning the lottery 22 times in a row would be the odds of one man fulfilling all of these prophecies. He fulfilled every single one of them. And Matthew wants to make sure that you understand that. Over and over again, he is trying to convince his people that this is indeed the Messiah that was to come. This is the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. But not only that... This is a fulfillment of his humility. Jesus Christ is demonstrating his humility in an incredible way. Look at verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on their cloaks and he sat on them. He sat on them. That doesn't sound very profound, but it does indeed. Because when a king comes with an entourage into a city, he can ride on two different uh, means. He can either ride on a donkey, that means he's coming as a prince of peace. Or he can come in on a horse, on a war horse, that means he's coming for battle and for war. Revelation 19, what is Jesus Christ riding on as his angelic army follows behind him? There will be a day... 
when he will not be sitting on a donkey, he will be sitting upon his glorious throne, as Matthew also mentions in Matthew 25, 31. He will return in his glory, but at this moment, he is not going to be glorified as he should be glorified, which is what's so crazy about Palm Sunday, because when we think about Palm Sunday, we think this is a time where they're, they're truly celebrating. I mean, they're going to pull out all the stops. They're going to go to level 10 on the worship scale, folks. This isn't even close. Not even close to the glory that he deserves and that he will get. The question I have to ask every single one in this room is, how are you receiving Jesus? Will he come on a donkey or will he come on a horse for you? Will he come on a donkey as the Prince of Peace? And will you receive him as Lord and Savior? Now, or will he have to come for you on a war horse? Every single knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Some to the glory of God. Will you do it to the glory of God? Or will you do it as you grind your teeth in rebellion against God? Regardless, every knee, every celebrity, folks, Everyone that exalts himself online or in social media, whatever it is, every knee will bow. Every politician will bow and declare allegiance to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords and and say he is the reigning God, whether I go to hell or whether I enter into the throne room with him. Just consider such things. It's a powerful thing to think about. Well, what else are we here to do? What else are we here to do? We are here to look at the greatness and the glory of God and to be transformed and to be challenged by such thoughts. Point number two, when Jesus Christ comes to town, he was worshipped in shallow ways by the crowd, and he still worshipped in shallow ways by the crowd. By the crowd. Don't just be part of the crowd. Be part of his people. Look at verse 8. Most of the crowd... Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees. I want you to think about how huge this crowd was. There was a census taken 10 years after this time where they counted out how many lambs were slaughtered for Passover. Because in the Passover meal, remember, the lamb is the number one item that you have to have. And there were 260,000 lambs counted for. One lamb for every 10 person, that, that means 2 million individuals, four to five times larger than a normal week in Jerusalem, just like Easter in a sense. And they slept outside if they didn't have a place to be, because this is a place where you absolutely had to be. So when you think of most of the crowd, you're thinking this is a massive entourage of people that are following after Jesus and they cut branches from the trees, symbolic of salvation. This is our Savior. Our Savior is going to come to us. And the crowds that went before him that followed him were shouting out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna means save us now. Save us now. Not save us later. This is the moment. This is the moment. The Messiah has come. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest They're thinking about the deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And they're thinking about all the bondage they are under right now. As they cry out Psalm 118, 25 through 26, which says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. But can I ask you this? What were they asking them for salvation from? It was not from their sins. It was not, Save us, O God, from our sins. Save us, O God, from ourselves. Save us from my depravity. Save us. No, they're saying, save us from the Romans that we so hate. 
As much as they hate us, we hate them. Will you please save us now from Herod, who we hate? And yes, he built upon this temple, but he calls it his temple. And we have to come and worship at this temple. And yes, it's not really our temple. We are a defeated nation. We are literally police stated around as a people. When we used to be the mighty best army in the entire world, we would wipe away anybody that would mess with us. You sit there saying, save us and let us return to that day. And you would say, well, that certainly does sound sincere. Well, does it? If you look at recorded history, they had sung this same song literally 100 years earlier, and they were singing it to Jonathan Maccabees. Have you ever heard of that name? I bet you've never even heard of it because I've never heard of it. I've been in seminary. When he literally took on the Seleucid army, they sang the same psalm to him, Hosanna, save us now. So in a sense, their worship was as fickle and in some ways shallow, at least the worship from the crowd. Not everyone worshiping there was having shallow worship, but there were many there that were filled with ignorant expectations of what God would do for them. How do you know that? Look at verse 10. Ignorant expectations. And when he entered Jerusalem... The whole city was stirred up. They're stirred up and they're saying this phrase, who is this? What do you mean? What do you mean, who is this? We're we're crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. And they're joining, hey, Hosanna to the son of David. After all, you'll do. You'll satisfy the need that I want. You'll be the idolatrous tool that I need to satisfy my want against the Romans or against Herod. And so often we are like that with God. We want to to fashion God in our own image. We want Jesus to be my Jesus. We don't care about what God's word says about Jesus. This is what's going on in the world today and in American Christianity today. We'll just twist and move scripture around and fashion Jesus any way we want to so that he will meet and satisfy a need that we perceive in our life, rather than simply bowing down to the Jesus of the text, the Jesus of Scripture. And they're over here thinking, this is it. This is the moment. Jesus is going to meet all of the needs like a shiny, novel, new tool. I mean, after all, he just raised Lazarus from the dead. And the other Pharisees are saying, you're wasting your time. Look, the whole world, the whole world has gone after him. We are so prone to do the same things, church family. I remember, remember when Aaron took, to, took uh, all the gold together and he fashioned together a golden calf and he said to all of Israel, these, these are your gods. These are the things that will deliver us. I wonder if there's anyone in this room and all of us are like this, that we are putting our trust in machinery or we're putting our trust in some other thing besides God, to deliver us from some type of problem. Folks, when it comes to the church, God's all about means, but I don't think that he blesses machinery. He's all about the means of text-driven preaching and text-driven teaching and text-driven discipleship. He's all about the means of prayer, of us praying and seeking God's face. He's all about the means of evangelism and sharing the gospel with the lost. We must do that. He's all about the means of biblical community as we see in Acts chapter 2. He's all about the means of biblical counsel. When you're in the midst of an unreconciled relationship to actually approach approach somebody and be a peacemaker. He's all about the means of teaching and training, but he's not about the machinery. The machinery of magic prayers and magic bullets and magic programs and formula and platitudes and bumper stickers and branding and sermon series and logos or whatever it may be. Let's put our trust in these things. These are the things we're not supposed to put our trust in. I don't want to just Get rid of all that stuff. Focus upon the greatness and the glory of God that we would be a hospital for the hurting. There are so many that are hurting in our city and in our congregation. And we are so busy being trophy cases. 
I would be polished. Look how great I look. It's not what this is about. Polishing our trophy case and our performances rather than being a hospital for the hurting. Point number three. Jesus does exactly what they don't expect him to do with this massive entourage of people behind him declaring Hosanna in the highest. You're going to deliver us. And look at verse 12. Where does he go? Not where he should go. You're supposed to go to Herod's palace. You're supposed to go to a Roman citadel. You're supposed to drive them out. You've got all the power behind you. You can raise the dead. Where does he go? Jesus enters the temple. Why? Why is Jesus entering the temple? He's about to make some people very nervous. First of all, the temple was the place of God's heart. That cannot be overstated any more than than that's the truth right there. The temple was the place, was the place of God's heart throughout the Old Testament. Everyone understood that. That's why they, the whole city was built around the temple. When they thought about the temple, they thought about God. Psalm 11, 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. Psalm 27, 4, one thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire choir in his temple. Psalm 138, 2, I bow down towards your holy temple. I bow down towards it, not because we're worshiping the temple, but because he's giving thanks. I give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. So when they thought about that temple, they thought about the name of God, of Yahweh, and they thought about his word and how faithful he is. And they would look at that temple and they would worship God because of it. But what does Jesus see when he shows up? He sees nothing but Temple Mart. Temple Mart. Look at verse 12. Keep looking at it. That temple would be the court of the Gentiles. He shows up to the court of the Gentiles where there would be thousands. That's before you can go into the temple. You can't, uh, Gentiles could not go inside the full temple, but they could, there was an outside area where they could come and they could worship and they could prepare themselves. But watch this. It had turned into a religious marketplace filled with selling and buying. The high priest at that time was a man named Annas, mentioned in John 18, also in the book of Acts. And this place was literally called the Bazaar of Annas or the Circus of Annas. Merchants would buy rights to a concession stand or a store to sell sacrificial animals, wine, oil, salt, or exchange money into the proper currency for the temple. And although they didn't have to buy animals from them, and it made sure that you had to go to the concession stand to buy an animal for sacrifice, and you would pay as much as 10 times what an animal normally cost. Foreign money would have to be exchanged at a 25% increase. So what is the heart that's going on here? Although they're putting God all over this, right? We're trying to market this as being a service, a rendering for God. It has the exact same values as the devil, And so often in our world, we sit there, we try to market even to God or to ourselves. that No, this is good. This is holy. This is righteous. This is pure. This is what God wants. This is what God wants. This is what God wants. We keep trying to convince ourselves we market it that way. And all the while, we're expressing the exact same values of the world. The world sometimes looks at us and says, you know what? You value the exact same things that I value, except I get to sleep in on Sunday morning and you don't. So what's the difference? And if we have nothing else to demonstrate as the difference in our life, not just behavior management, folks. We're talking about love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, a transformed life. We have drank from the living water and we have have our thirst quenched and other people desperately need that as well. They need to see And when you walk out of here, when you're hanging out in the world, they see a person that is satisfied. Satisfied. Psalm 65, 4, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness 
of your temple would that be said about you? Because remember, that temple was destroyed in 586 and it was rebuilt. And then it was destroyed in 70 AD. That temple does not exist right now. Where is the temple believer? Folks, it's you. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You're supposed to have that same longing and there's no separation. The Jew, there was separation. The Gentile, there was separation. You couldn't go into the holiest of holies. Guess what? The holiest of holies is inside of you now. Folks, that's fascinating. I know we just kind of read that. It's kind of, wow, that's really cool. It's cool stuff. But for a Jew, even a, a Jew that came to faith in Christ, that was such a difficult concept for them to understand. But what does he do? Point number four, Jesus cleanses the temple. Look at verse 12. He drove out. He drove out. He took the time to awkwardly embrace the incredible awkwardness of ministry at this moment. And with great passion and great zeal for God, he drove out all. Will you underline that, please? Not just some. He didn't make an example of some. He literally drove all of those who sold and bought in the temple, which would be dozens or hundreds of people. This may have took 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour. I don't know. But it wasn't just a quick process because he overturned the tables in John chapter 2. He had done this three years earlier with the coins on the ground. And the language is so similar we can, we can see that that must have happened. Coins on the ground. There's pigeons and doves and animals all over the place. There's this frenzy. There's this chaos. I thought Jesus loved order and peace. Yes, he does. But in order for there to be order and peace, he must drive out that which is wicked and unholy. And what's so fascinating about verse 12 is do you see any protest from anybody? He overturned the tables of the money changers and those seated and, and those who sold pigeons. So he's overturning the seats as well. You're not going to sit here anymore. Get it out of here. Get it out of here. Get it out of here. Keep going. And nobody bows up like one dude to another dude in a fight where you sit there and say, hey, you just threw that, that, my, my coins on the ground. And it's almost as if I know I'm not supposed to be here. Let me just throw this out here, out here as well. Jesus had done this three years earlier. He'd done this three years earlier, and the same people went back to the same post probably the very next day to do the same wicked things to satisfy their own wicked hearts. Can I just encourage every single person in this room who feels like giving up? You feel like giving up because you give and you give and you serve and you serve and you follow the Lord and you teach and you teach. And there's certain seasons in life where you go, does it matter? Does it even matter? I mean, I, I've served and I've served. It, does it even matter? Because the results don't seem to be showing that. Let me throw this out there. Jesus didn't care about the results here. He cared about being faithful to his father and demonstrating the zeal of God. And though those wicked people may come back the very next day, he was supposed to be faithful to his God. And you are called to be faithful to your God and not worry about the results. You leave the results to him and you live with zeal and with passion for Jesus. In John chapter 2, when he had done this earlier... They asked the question, why did Jesus do this? And this is what was reminded of the disciples. Zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal. Zeal. We are called to have zeal in our life, Christian. Get this. John chapter 12, 11, Do not be slothful in zeal. You realize it's disobedient to God to be slothful in your passion for Jesus. If you do not have a white hot passion for Jesus Christ. The, the, the question is why? The answer to the why is what you need to confess of and repent of now. There could be something in the, in the temple of your heart that you're allowing, some concession stand or some kind of thing that you're allowing in your life. and You just need to get rid of that. We're called to have zeal, to be faithful no matter what. Zeal for God consumed Jesus, and he wants us to have the same way, to be the same way. 
What else was consuming Jesus? Look at verse 13. When he did it the second time, it's a little bit different. Here's the commentary on the second time. Look at verse 13. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And yes, this is a commentary on prayer. Yes, we should be more so a praying people that depend upon prayer. But where is that verse found? It's found in Isaiah 56. Here's what's fascinating about Isaiah 56 1. It is an appeal to everyone that's not a Jew. In Isaiah, not a Jew, does God still love them? Yes. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And this was supposed to be the court of the Gentiles where the nations could come to God. And they could come and they could worship. And yet it was nothing but a den of robbers and selfishness and the devil's values. So Jesus takes the time, gets rid of all of the garbage And all of the junk, it may have taken 30 minutes, an hour, I don't know. But look at verse 14. True worship begins again. True worship begins again. Look at verse 14. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Do you notice that? The blind and the lame suddenly can get past all of the concession stands and all of the junk and all of the garbage and those that are in need suddenly get ministered to. Can I just throw this out there? If we get rid of the junk in our life, if we get rid of the leaven in our life that leavens all of us, just a little bit of yeast, it was a picture of sin, Sometimes it's those small sins that we allow. Let me tell you something. Those small sins have some heavy weight. Amen? Small sin in our life that we allow and just, just you know, I'm not going to mess. I'm not going to worry about that. It's not that big a deal. It weighs us down and it clouds up our vision. And we seem to live this Christian life like we've got giant anchors on our feet. And we wonder, why am I not running the race? Why am I not running the race like I should be running? All of us spent time to get dressed this morning and to look appropriate, to make sure that we looked great for church. Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. Everyone in this room, talking to myself here, have been guilty of being a hypocrite. You know, in the Greek, hypocrite means literally an actor. An actor. Now, I'll tell you what, those are fighting words. If I said to you, you know, you're being an actor today. You may not be an actor today, but I wonder what God would say about our worship. Would God ever say to you or to me, you know something, you might be having your hands up in the air, but let me tell you something, I'm not pleased with this area of your life. I don't care about the outside of the cup. God cares about the inside. He wants us to be cleansed, just like he cleansed out the temple. And we are the temple of the living God. And so often we're trying to mix and marry wickedness with him, and he will have none of it, which is why I believe in Revelation. He's outside. He's outside. He's not going to hang out with that. doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It means he is not going to fellowship with that. And we keep trying to get him to fellowship. Just agree. Just agree. Let's sign a treaty, Lord. I'll give a little. You give a little. Jesus does not compromise. He does not compromise. And this is, this is amazing right here. He also not only drives out the wickedness, 
but he corrects their theology along the way. This is crazy. Now, I wouldn't have written this in. I almost don't find this to, to fit anywhere, but I think the Holy Spirit will allow us space here this room to let it find a place. Look at verses 15 through 17. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, wonderful, wonderful, amazing things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, oh, children are messing up worship. Let me just throw this out here. We want children to mess up our worship. We're all about kids and teenagers and young people. And no, we don't want them to disrupt worship, but it's okay. Tear a baby cry. You know, it's okay. This is great. This is the people of God. God loves kids. He loves them so much. They became, they, they, they said to him, the children are crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They're the only one bringing true worship. You realize that? They're the only ones affirmed in the text here. He says, they became indignant. That means the Pharisees were greatly annoyed and frustrated the situation. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Don't you understand that they're calling you Jesus, the Messiah? They're blaspheming and you aren't doing anything about it. And he gives them, in a Jewish mindset, the sternest rebuke in the world. Because he says to them, it doesn't sound like it, but look what he says. Yes. And Jesus said to him, Yes. Have you never read Psalm 8-2? For a Jew, they would have memorized Psalm 8-2. Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. He didn't have to finish the next sentence because they already knew it. Because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. These kids are giving praise to God. And you're trying to silence them because you, you are the enemy of God. Stark, terrible rebuke trying to stop the praise of God. God gives a correction to our theology. Let me throw this out here. Proverbs twenty two fifteen. We hold to this. That folly is bound up in the heart of a child. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. Which is why we don't allow children to choose their gender. God has already chosen the gender of children. We don't have to ask them. What do you want to be when you grow up? I thought I was going to be a ninja. I was convinced of it. I believed in it. I am not a ninja. In case you don't know that, it never happened. Folly, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. That's why they need wisdom. That's why they need parents. That's why they need the church. But watch this. Jesus also said in Matthew 19, Luke 18, Mark 10, over and over again, let the little children come to me. Let them come to me and do not hinder them for such belong to the kingdom of heaven. We enter into the kingdom like a child. Not, the, not necessarily the age of a child, but like a child with humility and with brokenness. So I find something incredibly fascinating. Not only does he drive out the wickedness, but he also corrects their theology. When we talk about revival in the church, again, let me throw this out here. When we talk about revival, I honestly don't think God cares if your hands are like this or if you're a midway or if you're YMCA all the way. I, I don't think God cares one way or the other. You, you're free to express biblically the greatness and the glory of God any way you want to. It's all re as long as it's reverential. But now watch this. But this is what true revival is. And, and John the Baptist nailed it. It's Malachi 4, 6. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. To the children, he will turn the church's hearts also to children and to youth and to young people and to the next generation, no matter how old that generation may be. We begin to not just look at ourselves. We say, how can I make disciples who make disciples who make disciples? This is what he does in our hearts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for giving us a demonstration of what revival looks like, God, and that you want to do in all of our hearts, a symbolic picture, Lord God, 
We are a temple of the living God dwelling inside of us, Lord. And for everyone in this room that claims the name of Jesus that you know him, if Jesus Christ were to come through your heart right now and construct a whip, what would he drive out? (laughs) What would he overturn? What table are you playing with that he would overturn that table and let it all just fall to the ground? Lord Jesus, would you do that right now in our hearts? Everywhere around this room, those watching from home, no matter what you're going through, no matter what difficulty, what would he like to overturn? Maybe it's unbelief. Maybe you've stopped trusting him. You've stopped believing in him. You've stopped walking with him and you're doubting him. And he wants to overturn that table and drive it out of your heart. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's fear of something. Fear of the future. Fear of health reports. Fear of cancer. Fear, fear, fear. And he just wants to drive it out of you. Maybe it's some kind of immorality or sin. Would you confess it to him now? Party's over. The entourage isn't singing the praises. He's looking at you and saying, are you going to get rid of that? Get it out. Get it out. Get it out. So Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace and your mercy. If there's anybody here that wants to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, then you must call upon him as Lord and Savior. You must come to him on his terms. And say, you are the Lord. You're the boss. Would you forgive me of my sin? And would you become the Lord of my life? I want to follow you. That's all you have to do. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're going to have a time of invitation. If you prayed that, or if you need someone to help you lead you in a prayer of salvation, we'll be up here at the front. There'll be people up in the balcony. Or if you just need to pray with somebody. I mean, there's a burden on my heart. I just need to pray with somebody. Then come. This is not a time where we have to be glued to our seats. This is a time where we need to say, you know what, Lord Jesus, whatever you want is what you want. So we're all responding. We are all responding to how God wants us to respond. Let's all stand and let's sing and let's pray. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, I still follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning Amen. Will you just grab a seat just for a moment while we do a a few hundred announcements? (laughs) Thank y'all. Again, a few hundred announcements. This is uh, Easter season. So tonight, super excited about this. We talked about evangelism as being a means by which God uses to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. He does use ourselves and our mouths. So here's what we're going to do at 5 o'clock today. 
We've been talking about um, the One Mile Project and hitting Miller Streets. And we've already done phase one that's dropping off all the, the prayer flyers. And so we've been praying for this street. But if, will you meet at 445? And anyone's welcome to come. 445, we'll do a quick 15-minute training. 15 minutes, all you need. And we've got the material, and we're going to go hit some, some, uh, some doors. So if you're sitting there going, man, I'm scared to death. But I would absolutely love to do it. And guess what? That, this is for you, okay? We'll have some people that, that can do this. It's going to be great. So uh, 5 o'clock, we're only going to do it for one hour. You do anything for an hour, okay? So from 5 to 6, that's going to be today. Also, the youth are going to be out uh, passing out flyers for the extravaganza, okay? Which leads us to my next announcement. This Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, we're going to have inflatables and hot dogs. Uh, you don't have to jump on the inflatables. You don't have to eat the hot dogs, but the point is that we want you to come and mix with visitors and with guests and with parents. And we're inviting the community to come out and hunt Easter eggs because it's fun. Amen? It is fun. Okay? So the kids are going to do that. And also the teenagers are going to have an extreme egg hunt afterwards, right? I don't know what that looks like, but man, it's going to be extreme. You put extreme on anything with teenagers, man, it's awesome. It's extreme. Okay? This Friday... Good Friday service. We're participating in the Lord's Supper, okay? So again, we'd love for you to come back. It's going to be starting at 5.30. We're going to have worship, music, just like we did last year, and we're partaking of the supper together. So uh, it will also be uh, streaming online uh, for those who are, have to, those who are homebound and can't make it. But that's going to be uh, this Friday. So come at 5.30. Also, next Sunday, outside service, provided the weather is good. And we will be, uh, we got plenty of seats, and that's why we're doing it outside. It's going to be a fun, awesome Easter service where we celebrate the resurrection. So it's going to be a super day. So I know you'll be here. Invite people. It's amazing how many people still have not been invited to church. It kind of, everyone thinks they've been invited because it's on Facebook, but make a personal invitation. Find somebody and invite them. Um, also, ne the next Sunday, uh, Eclipse Sunday, April 7th, will also be outside. Okay? I'm going to have my wife give an announcement about the women's ministry. Okay. Ooh. So um, I asked Joey to make this announcement, and then as I started telling him details, he said, why don't you just do that? <laughs> so here I am. Can y'all believe it's almost April? Like, I'm really struggling with that. But April is coming, and April 20th, we have a spring brunch for all of our ladies. Um, we want you to come and be a part. We're going to have a, a special guest speaker, my sweet friend Monica Patrick. Um, she's been my friend for years, and she's the kind of person that every time I get a text from her or every time I talk to her, I just leave encouraged and refreshed. And so that's my goal for that event, that you will come, that you will bring somebody, and that you will leave encouraged and refreshed. Um, we are going to have tickets. They will be $10 a piece, and we will be selling them April 7th and 14th. So the Eclipse Sunday is one of those, which isn't ideal, but we'll make it work. And then the 14th, um, again, the event is going to be on the 20th of April at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's a brunch. And um, I still am in need of a few table hostesses. So if that's something you might be interested in, please come and see me. I have a list. Um, I'll tell you everything that you need to do. Um, but if you came for the Christmas tea, it's very similar. You just need to come and set a table and have ladies sit with you and mingle with them. So... And the table host, just to be clear, have to be women, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just, just to be Although clear, guys. we will probably be recruiting some men 